Hello, Blenders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 283 of Real Blend, a podcast that guarantees the actor's strike will end the moment we finish recording this episode. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Sean O'Connell. I'm the managing editor at Cinema Blend. And on this week's show, Taylor Swift. Have you guys heard of her? She is taking over cinemas. She's Marvel. not on the show. No, unfortunately. It sounds like you're going to be like, Taylor Swift is on the show. Yeah, well, Taylor, a good get. Taylor's co-hosting the show next week, so stu- tune in for that. Yeah, she's big, a little busy this week. The final, final stop on the Eras tour is uh, <laughs> it's it's real blend. <laughs> I'll take, I'd take Mama Kelsey at this point. <laughs> 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 degrees of separation. Uh, Marvel is shaking up their TV strategy, and we do have a guest this week. It's Gareth Edwards, who's going to be joining us to talk about The Creator, a film that we are uh, big fans of, and we want more people to go out and check out and see. And Gareth had been trying to come around on the show, scheduling conflicts and yada, 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 but we're happy to get him on specifically to be able to dive deep into spoilers so if you saw the creator and really love the creator this is the episode that you guys are going to want to pay attention to um joining me uh, as always this week is jake hamilton of fox 32 in chicago repping his strows uh i'm, I'm a little dis- disappointed in the baseball playoffs jakey because i'm a closet orioles fan and uh and we just got embarrassed on a national stage so You know, the the beautiful thing I always say this about playoff baseball is that it is for better or for worse, for good and for bad, a complete and total clean slate. It does Mm -hmm. not matter if you had a hundred win season or if you barely skirted by and got the wild card. Everyone's on a clean slate when that playoff uh, season begins. And uh, it's it's always fun. I love I love October baseball. And this year's been kind of wild, like Dodgers are getting Dodgers. I mean, Dodgers. Dodgers have a tough time with the playoffs. Dodgers, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, uh, admittedly. You know, but, uh, you know, it's uh, Astros are up 2-1 right now. We could we could move on tonight uh, with a win against the Twins. And uh, by the time you're listening to this, you'll know you'll know what kind of mood I'm in. Kev McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, yeah. D.C. doesn't have a dog in this fight because um, his nationals are his, not in the playoffs. It, but yeah, but his nationals kicked our ass a couple of years back. In the we do have a really good. We have a good team here, and so uh, well. First of all, good to see you guys. Um, Hi, Kev. Uh, How are you, I, have, I have been watching so much football, and I've said that this on makes the, me so happy. I said this on the show <laughs> recently. I'm, and I said it recently. I'm obsessed with the way the game is played, and I've just been watching it from a technical perspective. But every Sunday, actually, no, every Thursday, sa- Saturday, I watched. I watched three college games. Sunday, I watched three NFL games and Monday night I watched an NFL game and I'm just all in on it. I mean, I'm obsessed watching. I love watching Brock Purdy. I think Zach Wilson's story is incredible. Uh, I'm just having a really interesting time. I know Zach Wilson with the Aaron Rodgers thing, but I think I know he already kind of had his ability to show how great he was. But I like an underdog story or an underappreciated story of somebody. Sure. Um, Sure. And I'm just watching. I've just been enjoying it. But uh, the commanders obviously are. (laughs) We had a rough one (laughs) this uh, this this past week. So it was on Thursday night. That was really, really brutal. So hopefully we'll come back better this weekend. The Bears, Kevin. it's funny. Uh, I, I, I don't know why I didn't text Jake about this, because we were playing the Bears and you guys destroyed us at our own stadium here in, in, in FedEx Field in Maryland. And it was, uh, it was I thought about you, Jake, because you guys hadn't yeah. won a game in 14 games. You yeah. guys had so yeah. much. You guys had so much more to uh, to take yeah. on. And Matt, game, so. I just talked to Magic Johnson, who is part owner of you guys and was yep. not was not a, not happy. I don't think he's I, happy with with the Dodgers or the commanders right now. But <laughs> yeah, this is not yeah. a sports podcast. Maybe it will it become isn't. one. Yeah. <laughs> might as well branch off and, and then yeah. will Sean down. say, will Sean say, we used to be a movie podcast. We used to be a movie podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we used to be an Dude. awards cop podcast that turned into a movie podcast, but now. What could the uh, name of Real Blend be? Sports if it were Blend. Sports. Yeah, sports, nah, it's too easy. It's got to be uh, real sports. <laughs> I, think, real I sports. think real sports is taken. <laughs> real talk real sports. Blend. <laughs> I like ball blend. That's really good, actually. If I mean, that, you that are covers watching a lot of sports. On YouTube uh, for your Real Blend podcast needs. Hello, first off. Thank you very much for joining us. It's, this uh, is your first hat- episode. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's three hat day, uh, by the way. Gabe's going to have to show himself for his hat. Uh, and Kevin decided not to go hat. I yeah. like the hat check. I, we I like we hat should check start uh, like people should start making bets. Like, yeah. okay, who's going to have a hat? Who's not? Who's going to have a hat? Yeah. Oh, I do like that. Um, for audio listeners, if you want to join us in video form, <laughs> for audio to listeners who don't care whether or not we're wearing hats, YouTube.com. Uh, you know what? I'm very curious who listens to this in audio format. Like, what's the split of video to audio? 
um, because I, I'm just if you're in the comments on the YouTube channel, let me know if how you prefer. We well, they get clearly, some photographs. If they're, if they're commenting people. on YouTube, they're they clearly. No, that's not true, because if they're listening via their uh, device and or in their car or something, then they're going to go to the YouTube channel and leave me a comment and let me know that, mm-hmm. hey, I listen in okay. my car or okay. uh, I have a long commute and I listen while I'm on the train or something like that. Um, have you signed up for Real Blend Premium? When you sign up for Real Blend Premium, you can get an ad-free version of the podcast and a newsletter from me every other Friday, not this week. Check the description for information on where you can sign up. All right, we got a lot to get to this week. And I mentioned at the beginning of the show that Gareth Edwards uh, it was coming on. He's been trying to come on and talk about the creator, and we just couldn't get our, our schedules lined up, but we're happy to have him on now. Uh, the creator is playing in theaters. It's about to... Um, Take a back seat to the juggernaut that we will discuss uh, uh, after the Gareth Edwards interview. Um, but everything's taking a back seat to Taylor Swift when she comes in. But we still recommend highly that you guys go out of your way to go see the creator on the big screen because um, visually it's a stunning film. And the VFX, to me, seem to be the front runner uh, to contend for the Oscars for for visual effects and, and special effects work. And, um, and it's a great story. John David Washington is terrific in it. Um, it's interesting, heady sci-fi that I don't think we get enough of in theaters. And so the boys pinch hit. I was going to go see um, Priscilla and Jake and Kevin took the lead on this one and got a chance to speak to Gareth Edwards about the creator. I want to remind you guys again, if you're listening uh, on audio, if you're watching on video, this is a spoiler filled conversation, uh, a deep dive into all things the creator uh, and Gareth getting pretty candid about the film's performance at the box office. So I think you can find some really interesting things to listen to in this talk. Kev, you want to throw something in? Well, I just wanted to say um, out of all the interviews we've done on this show, and we've done a lot over the years, um, one of the things that I, I love that we can give our audience is the ability to get inside a filmmaker's mind um, in terms of their writing process and their filmmaking process. So uh, if this is a movie that you maybe you haven't seen or you're not super interested in yet, but you are interested in filmmaking in general, uh, mm-hmm. may, I think this will uh, unlock something for you. I think it'll even make you even more excited for the film if you haven't seen it. Jake and I both love this movie. Um, but this is truly, to use the term, as a masterclass in filmmaking. The way he talks about his writing process in this interview and filmmaking is amazing. So any young mm-hmm. filmmakers out there, listen closely to what he's saying because he's basically giving you some inside information that I haven't even, you know, we haven't heard before in interviews on our show. So this is a really cool conversation that Jake and I were able to be a part of. So I'm honored that we have this. All right. Gareth Edwards is the director of Rogue One Star Wars story. Uh, Godzilla and the creator is and joining monsters. the Rogue One podcast and monsters. monsters. Very oh, good film yes. as well, too. Uh, here's Gareth Edwards talking to the creator. First of all, this is an honor we're having, uh, to have Gareth Edwards on the show today. We're talking all about The Creator, uh, one of the greatest films I've seen in a long time, a truly remarkable story about AI that also has such a beautiful human element to it. I always kind of think of it as like a spiritual sequel to Terminator 2 in a way and kind of what would happen in the post-apocalyptic aspect of that. But one of the decision, uh, conversations we were having on our show recently, Gareth, was obviously with the budget of this film and the way it looks. It looks like a $300 million film. I think the budget was around 80. And it really, truly looks remarkable. And I was we were wondering how you achieved the effect of seeing through the head of the AI. Um, And I know in traditional filmmaking, maybe you'll shoot a plate and you'll have two shots. And then in post, you can put that together to make it look like we're seeing through the head of somebody or seeing through a hole. Um, But you have a lot of shots that have to have that in the film. Does that mean you have to shoot twice every time you did it? How does that how do you work that out with your budget? Oh, no, um, thank you for your very kind words to start with. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, it's interesting because you mentioned Terminator 2. And I think the budget for that was 90 or something back in the day. Mm. And just like budgets have massively es- escalated, like way beyond inflation. Um, yeah, in terms of the whole, I think we didn't do any of those safety passes. So we didn't, I mean, the Andrew, who was our onset VFX suit, the you know, poor Andrew, he was basically told to stay away <laughs> whilst we shot the scenes. And I wouldn't let anybody in to kind of like, you know, potentially distract us going through uh, a scene with the actors and stuff. And then at the end, they were allowed to do whatever they wanted. So they might, well, I'm sure they shot the hell out of those rooms and those environments to get enough things to paint through. But basically it's a load of blood, sweat and tears with people doing paint out. Um, The only shot that we actually planned to see through the hole was there's this one where Sturgill Simpson is looking through with like a little tool. And so we built a silver, like a chrome, um tube kind of thing 
and he would look through that and pretend he's talking and and so we we did that one for real in camera but the rest is just that like just the very difficult you know people don't see their families for six months kind of paint out stuff <laughs> Can you, for our audience who's listening to the show there, we have a lot of filmmaking fans in the show. Can you expand a little bit on the paint out aspect of it? Like if we're looking at a shot of Alfie and we're, we're able to see through the the head, like, can you give us an example of how yeah. that operates? I'm not an expert obviously, but what my understanding is it's a lot of, it's, it's laborious and as hard as you imagine, which is, you know, you met people who are familiar with Photoshop you kind of like, I could paint you out now looking at you on zoom. I could sort of like, kind of, I could guess what the clouds are doing behind you, copy and paste them. And it's kind of that technique to create a blank plate. So essentially, but then everything's moving quite, quite often it's moving in different parallaxes. So like, it's not as simple as just sticking a 2d image behind. And so there's a lot of um, clever animation and it's, it's very, very difficult. And, and I always hope, you know, and soon there might be a, a, you know, a workaround with AI and things like that, where it's a lot faster um, and sort of automated. But it's on our film, a lot of it was just, you know, sheer manual labor, I think. Wow. wow. Um, Gareth, you mentioned AI, uh, which I think is really interesting because in the times that we're in and the conversation about AI that we're having and the focus that it is on, on the, the simultaneous strikes, I was surprised that, and we're going to get into spoilers since the movie's been out for a little bit. I was surprised that kind of one of the twists in the film is that, hey, maybe AI is not the bad guy or entirely the bad guy, um, which is sort of the opposite of what I thought it was going to be going into this film. So I'm sort of curious. Uh, obviously, you know, this film was written and, and directed and, and made long before this AI conversation came up in our society. but as AI has sort of taken the role of villain in our day-to-day -day life, was there a part of you that was concerned about a twist being that, hey, maybe AI isn't so bad after all? No, because I stand by that twist. Like, I think... Oh, it's a great twist. I didn't mean no, to I mean, um, in, be dismissive. I mean, as in, I don't think AI is going to be the end of the world. Um, and I do think the point of the movie, if there is a point, and you don't... The worst thing you can do on day one when you sit and try and write a screenplay go, is go, I'm going to make a film about... That has this moral or, like, this thing to preach in it because you'll make a terrible movie. But as you start making it, whatever is the underlying kind of um, moral of the story, you know, starts to bubble up to the surface. And if you recognize it, you can amplify it and help it a bit or make it subtle. And... And the moral of this story really was using AI as just to represent people who are different to you, like the other from us. And that we, the way we always treat the other as the enemy and want to wipe them out or destroy them and vice versa. And, you know, today more than ever, I think that's the biggest problem facing the world is that we have sort of polarized and gone, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. And over, if you listen, you know, if you manage to get over to the, what you call the bad guys, place they would be saying we're the good guys and they're the bad guys and have equally valid reasons mm -hmm. and that's kind of what the movie's about and i and and it was using ai as a metaphor for that and then suddenly you know ai becomes this no longer flying cars and living on the moon sci-fi scenario it's actually here and and actually to be honest like I, the journey of the movie it's a great thing if you go into the film with your arms folded saying, I hate AI, you know what I mean? I think this is a terrible idea. I think that helps the journey of the film. That was kind of, it's kind of helped, I think, help the movie. Mm -hmm. For sure. You know, Gareth, one of the things that's interesting to me is you're dealing with a huge scope and scale. We discussed this in our television interview about the aspect ratio and that 276 and that 35 to 1 for Screen X, but, and then the camera you shot on and Oren Soffer and Greg Fraser, everybody that's involved. But at the end of the day, the subtlety of the way the arcs come across, the reason I mentioned Terminator 2 is because I, I always thought that Arnold's performance in that film was brilliant because he's slowly becoming more and more human as the movie goes on emotionally, I found. And he goes, I know now why you cry. And you have that beautiful moment. And in your film, you essentially kind of have, in my opinion, a subtle arc like that with as well with John David and obviously the Alfie character as they're both essentially finding humanity. Like he basically was, you know, dead inside after what happens to his character. And he's slowly kind of finding that humanity again. And same with Alfie teaching him kind of that John Connor Terminator effect. And I wanted to ask you about building that up and kind of earning that arc because we have to 
we have to believe that John David's character will go through this after the tragedy that happens and you make it work. And as you're building your film, like what are the key subtleties you have to focus on to make us believe that arc? Um, I have it. My, my girlfriend's a screenwriter and we have a joke, which is not far from the truth, which is um, a, a character arc is three sentences. It's I will never, ever do that. I, okay. I might do it. Okay, guess I'm gonna fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, you just saved place. someone like a hundred thousand dollars on on like writing school, by the way. Creative writing on school. master class, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's like it sounds. It's not what it is. Is you put there's like milestones in the movie that you sort yeah. of like. I think of a film not as a straight line, but as a clock, like a circle. Mm. And and okay, this is gonna get really silly now for a second. But like one, like so basically, mid from twelve to three is first act is kind of like your setup of the story. Then the second act, which lasts an hour typically in a two hour movie is from three till 9 PM. Mm. And that's your character arc. So basically your character goes on a 180 degree journey through that, that part of the movie. And so you're, <laughs> and so what uh, is this? Can I do spoilers on this? So, I mean, yes, yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so my favorite thing or the thing I was like, if the, the two flags are planted was that, uh, three o'clock and nine o'clock, if you want to call it that, like at the beginning of act two and at the end of act two. And the first one was essentially he kills a robot in ground zero mm -hmm. and thinks nothing of it. It's like killing an animal. If you look, worked in an abattoir or something, doesn't even flinch. And when the girl freaks out and he sort of realized, and he says, they're not real, it's just programming. Then it felt like the ultimate version of that is that if at the end of act two, after he's foul for this whole thing with this child, that someone says that back to him, and you mm. sort of realize, oh my God, I've completely changed. And, you, and you're and you still guessing at that point, like, is he going to snap out of this? Was that all a lie? Or is he going to commit and stick to like this idea that maybe these people are equal to us, you know? And that that's essentially, and then you basically put in things throughout in between that to, to sort of basically between those two, like 100 and zero, you start putting in 25 and, you know, you, there's all these little things and there's lots of movies that do it. Um, like I looked at Rain Man was a really good reference. Um, mm. Even a fit film called Paper Moon um, and uh, Perfect World. Mm. Um, they're all got these tropes, you know, of, of a character, like these odd couples on a, on a road movie type thing. I'm getting chills now thinking back to the the full circle of standby, not off. And then the moment where he says, I would do anything to have one more minute. And just the way you kind of full circle that at the end, kind of mad. I imagine those things when, when you're talking about that, it's pretty cool. So uh, yes, I'd like to let you in on a, like a trick. Yeah. I shouldn't give away the tricks, but I'm saying, end, yeah, we're just writing all these things down. I'm like, oh, yeah, we, yeah, we got this. It's easy. It's easy. Trust like, me, if it were easy, everyone would make movies this good. <laughs> if you see it as a circle, then what you do when you're struggling with one side of the circle, you basically mirror it the negatively on the opposite side. Oh, so for wow. instance, I'm this massive spoiler, close your ears if you've not seen it. But when um, he reunites with her mm -hmm. and like essentially that's all he gets is one minute with her. You know, he doesn't get a lifetime again. It was like to help that moment, we invented him saying that um, on the oh. like, about the same time from, you know, basically the same time on the other side of the of, you know, mm -hmm. the mirrored side of the circle is he says that line. And so it kind of all reflects each other through the story. It's sort of. A cheap trick but it kind of works no but it hit the, me like a ton of yeah. bricks you know and the, and the crazy thing is like when you think about the fact that like throughout the film you've been showing us that this is possible but at no point did i ever think oh he's going to use that to be reunited with her it was just one of those like oh my god mm. of course he like he's been planting these seeds for like a two hour mm. runtime, and at no point did i realize like what the tree was that was going to grow um you mentioned two hours and the reason i bring that up is that one of my favorite uh quotes is from roger ebert who said that uh no good movie is long enough and no bad movie is short enough and when this movie ended one of the first things i thought was i could have sat here for another hour if you had told me that there was like a three hour cut of this I'd be in like, and it, and it, it would have, I, I would have justified it. I'm sort of curious. I think you told Kevin that there was a longer cut of this. I'm just sort of curious what uh, has been cut out and might we ever see sort of a longer version of this down the road? Yeah. The first assembly, which you'd never, ever want to watch. I would never want to watch it again. Um, <laughs> no disrespect to anybody who put it together. It's just really fat and you know, that nobody trims anything in the assembly um, was just under five hours. 
And so like we shot the hell out of this film. Um, we probably shot two movies, to be honest, in terms of the amount of material. Um, and then really all we did is compressed everything. So there are missing sections and scenes. There's lots of things that I missed, you know, that I loved that we never refined after a certain point. They did say at the end, like, do you want to stick some of the deleted scenes on the Blu-ray? And I hadn't had a chance to refine them because once you decide they're not in the movie, you move on and you've got like lots of work to do with stuff that is in the movie. And I re I said no, because I would love one day, depending on how the world ever felt about our movie, if there was a desire for it and there was time, I would love one day to refine them and make them just right and put them back in where they belonged. And there was lots and lots of things, you know, I could list loads, but, um, you know, it's, it's, the movie is, there's a lot of flashbacks. So, you know, when you see little glimpses of scenes with say Gemma Chan's character and John David, their whole scenes that got compressed into like a few sentences and things and, um, and I, I mean, at the end, to be honest, what's really interesting, this is being totally like giving way too much information, but, um, we did a test screening and towards the end of the movie, um, and it, it didn't score the numbers we wanted. And I basically had a lot of pressure to get to that number and, mm -hmm. and essentially no one agreed. You look at these pieces, these forms that people fill in, they say, my favorite thing is this, my least favorite thing is that. And everyone was disagreeing. Like, no, there was no consensus about anything. And it was really hard to pick it apart. And the people who organized mm -hmm. those screenings said, we've seen this before. And it typically means it's too long. And it was two hours 15 at that point. And so we just, we just in these, in two weeks, we just went, okay, let's take out 15 minutes. And oh, so we, wow. put, and it was really hard to pull out a minute or 10 seconds at a time. Like you go through the movie and you think you've done a lot and you look at it and you took out one minute and you go, oh my God. And so we found it easier to build it from scratch. So without looking back at the movie, we sort of built a, you know, a 30 minute version of the film and then a, you know, a 50 minute version and then got, you know, eventually got it close to two hours. And it was like, okay, do you, do you remember, is there anything you wish you could go and get that you, you know, and we, we, we didn't look at it on purpose. And then we, then finally, when we got to two hours, we we're like, okay, let's watch it. And we watched those 15 minutes and we all felt sad because we're like, well, it's all really good stuff, but but then we hit play to a, a an audience and it scored way higher. And it was mm -hmm. a very strange thing because, you know, you'd have people write, I wish it was longer. And you think, well, I don't, I think you think <laughs> that, but you know, it's, it's like they're one of my, I once got to work with this amazing poster designer called Neil Kellerhouse. And he did things like um, the social network poster and things like this. Oh, and, wow. And he, um, he's, I said, what's your favorite poster that you've ever done? designed he says i just love doing the criterion collection and i was mm. like why and he said because i'm not having to sell the movie people are already in they love the film i don't have to do anything that explains the movie i can just go for it and i feel like mm. when you do a special edition it's kind of what you're doing because people who want to see it or buy it they already like the movie and so you don't have to set up the world you don't have it can just then be all those nice like pieces that you missed but i think for the actual movie that comes out in the cinema um, you've got, you know, you've got people turning up with their arms folded and this had better be not Terminator 2, you know, and, <laughs> and so you've got a, like, you've got a different audience to, to cater for, I think. It's, it's actually really interesting you bring that up because I purposely always watch the special edition of Terminator 2 because it has like this great scene where Arnold's trying to smile. It's just like such a great moment. And then that addition, and it's kind of like what you're saying, Cameron obviously had those scenes and just didn't put them in the theatrical. I don't um, know if you can tell, this, Kevin <laughs> likes Terminator 2. A no, little I love, bit. I love Terminator 2. It's, it's a phenomenal movie. I mean, it's, it's the like, best. like yeah. you're copying that masterpiece. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's one of the greatest. You know, this might be a loaded question, but I think it'll make sense because John David Washington, I think, Think is obviously an incredible actor with the work he did with spike on black Klansman, and obviously what he did with a nolan on tenant um and you think about interestingly enough tenant specifically uh he's talking about oppenheimer in that one moment and obviously he's trying to save the world from whatever this particular uh threat would be essentially in a nuclear holocaust aspect of things even though it's inverted in a way um but i wanted to ask you about that through line of john david uh and kind of like that idea of his character in tenant what he's doing in tenant now living in a post-apocalyptic world as a different character um but i guess the question really is what do you think of that through line 
from John David through Tenant to your movie and kind of like what he's trying to do. And just, I don't know, I'm just wondering if you had thoughts about that. I know it's kind of a loaded question. Um, I loved Oppenheimer. Um, I actually did when I was uh, um, early in my career, when I was doing visual effects, um, one of the bigger things I got to do was a film about Hiroshima. And so I, I was very familiar with Oppenheimer, with the BBC documentary that I got to do. And we actually tried to use that I am um, become deaf destroyer of worlds quote for a, a Godzilla teaser that we did. And we had, we used it at comic con, but we could never put it online. I think it's snuck out online here and there. And so, yeah, so I, I, I was, you know, first in line to go see that film. I think it's phenomenal. They, um, it's funny you tenant, you should mention tenant because something I've actually never mentioned in an interview. You just remind me of it is there's a scene in the movie where, there's a there's a ambulance crash in a tunnel at was the end in America and and we shot that in Bangkok and we had to close down that street so we basically owned that tunnel for like a day and we had all these stunt drivers in cars that could do that crash over and over they never once scratched the cars it was pretty amazing they did it like 30 times but what was so funny is after they did a crash and we'd go reset to actually properly drive back round would have taken an hour. So basically everyone just went in, went in reverse. And it, was, <laughs> it was it was really funny because it was like a scene from Tenant where you had John David and these cars just going backwards. And, <laughs> and it just felt like, hasn't someone already made this film? <laughs> <laughs> That's um, awesome. Gareth, uh, you know, Kevin and I are both on record as saying that this is one of our favorite movies this year, both on our oh, podcast yeah. here and then in our respective uh, TV stations. Um, so if I'm being honest, I, I am a little disappointed that that box office wise, it's not doing the numbers that I think it deserves to do, which I find interesting because you think of some of the greatest sci fi films of all time. I was my mind goes to Blade Runner. Sometimes they don't find their audience in that time. And then over time, you look back and you go, how did people not see that? Or, or John it's a Carpenter's wonderful life. thing. Yeah, it's that a wonderful life. John bombed, Carpenter's a yeah. thing. I'm just sort of curious your thoughts on just how it's how it's doing and just just um, its longevity and, and finding movies later in life and, and the comfort that that gives you as a storyteller. Yeah, it's a tricky one. It's... Um... It's a weird one. And I had COVID. I, I basically, the idea was we were all going to meet up with the actors on opening weekend and organize this party. And then right in the publicity tour, I, I ended up, I tested positive and felt terrible. So I couldn't even celebrate with everybody. So it's such a strange finish line for what was like a four year journey. Um, but I mean, I'm not equating our film to those masterpieces you mentioned, but I do have always felt it's a very strange thing how people it's not how people feel about your movie on opening weekend. It's how they feel about it 10 or 20 years later. And, and I don't know how they're going to, they might hate it in 10 or 20 years. You know what I mean? It might age terribly, but, but I do feel like if you had to have one or the other, I would go for the latter one. Um, who knows? We'll find out, but I, we're all really proud of it. And, and, you know, I, I would do it all again. Um, I think we've come out the other end of it, you know, maybe not box office wise, but in other respects, I think better off having, you know, made that movie than having not. So we'll see what happens. We'll just see how it plays over time. And and, and I, I've got, I, I don't know, Alfie's out into the world now and it belongs to someone else. So I, I wouldn't have asked that question if I didn't think it was going to play well over time. Yeah. I asked that question so it's on the record now so that we can look back in 20 years and go, see, told you. You know what's funny is when you see, like I've seen a lot of interviews with Ridley Scott about Blade Runner and mm -hmm. everyone yeah. talk about how um, amazing it is. And there's this little like, he has a little reaction when people first say it, like, well, it wasn't at the time and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it, it sort of seems strange to us now that that was true, but... Um, it must have been painful for him, you know what I mean? Because he did make a masterpiece. And the same with it, you mentioned It's a Wonderful Life. And I remember reading that Frank Capra was, felt he had made this masterpiece and then no one went and saw it. And it was, I mean, I'm, this is, you know, no way near what our film is. So, but just out, you know, just in terms of the, the analogy, um, it's it's difficult. It's, I think, but I'm very, I'm very proud of everyone and, and we'll see, we'll just see how it ages and see how it, how it does over time. But I'd do it all again. 
I mean, it really is fascinating. You know, I'm looking this up right now. Blade Runner opened to six million dollars in its opening weekend. Six million dollars made forty one million worldwide, and that film is still being talked about today as one of the greatest movies of all time. So, to Jake's point. That's a really interesting thing to think about. Some of the greatest movies of all time not performing at the box office at the time they come out. But um, this podcast is designed literally to engage with people who are interested in filmmaking. They want to learn more about how movies are made. I know you talked at length about Oren Soffer and the FX3, and um, but it really is a brilliant thing to think about the fact that you shot this film for the budget that you did with the camera that you used. Uh, Greg Fraser obviously went on to do Dune 2. You bring in uh, Aaron Soffer, who's incredible, does a brilliant job. But the way you design this film, and I think this is different from a lot of how, how other films are made, when you're out shooting these special effects shots, is it true that you didn't really have like markers or things and ILM kind of had to just go in and add things? Can you talk about the process of what the Sony FX3 gave you as a, as a filmmaker and then kind of how the visual effects then were played in? Because we were talking about this in the show. I can't tell where visual effects start and end in this movie. It all just kind of feels like the world. Like when this thing opened up on an IMAX screen, while it was wide as hell, like a Ben-Hur, like Lawrence of Arabia type of thing, it was just engul engulfed my perspective. Um, but you have so much visual effects in there that seem seamless. Can you talk about the process of that camera and the idea of how the visual effects worked with ILM? Um, yeah, like I think in terms of the seamlessness of it, if you want to call it that, the the thing that we did that was a little bit different was we did it, we did it at the end, we did the design of the film at the end. Typically, what happens is you say you design a let's just call it an environment or a world or whatever, but some like floating village thing or whatever, and and you design it all, and someone would look at that and go, I can we can never find the place that's like that. Um, if you want it to look exactly like that, then we'll probably have to build all this foreground structure. And then I think probably put green screen behind and shoot it like every other movie ever. And so our point was like, well, it doesn't have to look exactly like this concept art. It's just, this is just a reference of how cool it could look, but it's not going to, if we chase this specifically, we'll end up in that green screen, screen, green screen scenario. So let's not do that. Let's go to somewhere. That, let's find for every scene in the movie, we try to find the closest looking real world location to what the, you know, the concept art or the, you know, the film, the visual references look like. And then what you, what we did, which is I can, I, I'll use an example that's in the trailer because it's a lot easier to explain. There's a shot where like a missile comes down from the sky and the camera tilts and you see yeah. these strange kind of like, I'd call them, well, there's, I don't even know what they are. They're sort of like teapot structures and mm. and in the distance and stuff. Now we waited to design that until we had the plate. So i.e. the footage. So you shoot this footage and what, if what you're trying to do when you put in the crazy sci-fi stuff is blend it in with the foreground in such a way you can't see where the divide happens. And so oh. we're, we're looking at the foreground and in the foreground, there was this kind of, I don't know what you like, a, a, an onion kind of shaped building. And, and so, and that was fully there, like behind the trees and it was a hundred percent there. And so it's like, okay, so the giant crazy sci-fi thing we put behind it, let's make it that onion shape. And then the audience will be confused because they'll go, <laughs> well, I know that's got, that's got to be fake. And then their eye will follow the thing that's the foreground onion and go, but that can't be real either because that's been put in. But hang on, that looks totally real. And so it's always like taking the something that's actually in the original footage and then copying and pasting that onto the fake thing and and scaling it up and making it look like it. So it looks like our design was always to include some shapes or textures or mm. materials that are 100% in the foreground. And so it's just like riffing off what's already there to to, to then. So you it's really hard to find the divide. Um yeah, and in terms of the camera, um, I think like if we shot this next year, it might well be a different camera or the year after um, and the year before. And so it was more the case that the FX3, it's incredibly lightweight and it doesn't matter, you know, obviously it's like a little, um, like a mirrorless uh, SLR camera. But yeah. the reason being is that once you stick an anamorphic lens on the front, like a 1970s lens, it's 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 about like a pound of like a bag of sugar in terms of its weight or maybe two bags of sugar and then you've got to put on it a gimbal that stabilizes all the camera movement and that's even heavier and by the time you put the gimbal and the handles on that's about the maximum i could hold all day without dropping dead 
And so if we had a bigger camera, we have to have a bigger gimbal. Suddenly I've got these massive arm things on a backpack and I look like Sigourney Weaver from Aliens and <laughs> can't do anything, you know, opportunistic. And so, so it was all about the size of the camera. Then on, on top of that, it shot at this thing called 12,800 ISO. So it's very, very sensitive to light, which meant we didn't need mm. crazy massive lights everywhere. We could shoot in available light a lot of the time. And and then also the color science on it got very good. It's it's kind of they pulled it down, I think, from the Sony Venice, which is the high end cinema camera. And so it we could make that look like Kodak film stock with the way we could bend the colors in the post, you know, using a, a thing called a LUT. Um, you put 35 millimeter grain at the end and in, in post because because that probably helps out the seamlessness of the effects too i would imagine yeah so so the idea always was um we were going to film it out so basically you edit the film you put it all together you grade it and then you um you essentially print it to film stock and develop the film stock and then it and then therefore it looks like film right a little bit and and that was always the idea and it's an expensive thing to do um and as we got close to the end, I'd sort of burnt through all of our money with other things. And they were like, Gareth, we can't, we can't do the film out. We can't do the film out. And so and I was adamant I wanted to do it. And so they did like a Pepsi challenge where they had emulated the film stock. They had really analyzed it to death at Photochem and they'd emulated exactly what film stock does. And I had to watch this A, B. And one of them to me looked more like film than the other. And so I just was like, oh, that's the film. And they were like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the digital emulation and so i i couldn't complain at that point and so we digitally did the whole thing so it's film stock kind oh. of grain and and you know but it's all done digitally wow awesome uh, man gareth if you can't tell man we are massive fans of you and your work and this film and and kevin and i each have probably a thousand more questions to ask you but we know you got other things to do today so seriously from the bottom of our heart thank you for joining us on real blend congratulations on a truly truly uh, remarkable film and we hope you'll come back on the show someday oh no thank you so much and thanks for supporting the movie i really appreciate it thank you always man take care awesome talking to you man we really want to thank our friends at Disney and specifically uh, Gareth Edwards for coming back on the show. This, one of those situations where, and we talk about this a lot when we're trying to book interviews, we use the hashtag if it happens. And, yeah. you know, sometimes we adhere to the junket schedule and sometimes we do pursue people uh, off junket and, and try to get different people. And quite often when we're told like, oh, yeah, you know, we're going to make that happen. We sort of put that in our back pocket as like, OK, that might not actually. Especially during the award season. A hundred percent. And especially after someone has just spent, you know, weeks or months doing press. And so I really want to give credit to Gareth, um, who, despite his busy schedule, really went out of his way to come back around and, and come on the show. And so it was really great that we got a chance to showcase not just him, but but this movie, which, again, we highly recommend that everybody yeah. go go to check out now that it is in theaters. And it was interesting to get this perspective from him. Uh, obviously, post release, Jake brought up the question about the box office and it really led it ended uh, ended up becoming an interesting discussion about classics that just kind of yeah. never uh, took hold of the box office. And then yeah. Because yeah, I, I didn't want it to be a um that was an a great insulting question. question. You know, I really no. I really didn't want to insult him with with that question. But I'm, I'm glad that that's the area to your point, Kevin, that that's yeah. where it went, you know? And yeah, I'm glad well, you brought up it's a wonderful life. Cause he seemed to snatch onto uh, that. And the Blade Runner thing was interesting. I know we got to move on, but like, that's a, that, that perspective of how much movie that money, that movie made opening weekend, I think it was $6 million is pretty insane to think about. And, and we're still talking about that movie today. So just to throw that on top of it as well, too. Another reason why Gareth could have just bailed is that, the when your movie doesn't well. really do the up to the potential that you wanted to do, the mm -hmm. last thing you want to do is come on and do more press on behalf of it. Yeah. But, you know, I think he really believes in the film and oh, yeah. it'll find its audience mm -hmm. in time. It's just yeah. right now. And it's so interesting because I had a, a and I, I tweeted about this because it was pretty eye opening to have a conversation with a friend of mine um, who lives here in Charlotte, who, you know, somewhat follows the film industry and has no real idea of movies that are coming out um, and i won't name drop the ones that we were discussing but like i mean zero awareness of some of the films that we would in a conversation like probably view as you mean some they of were the biggest films to come 
They weren't super yeah. excited to see Saltburn. They they weren't like wearing like Saltburn t shirts. I literally and, like, just got out of Saltburn. <laughs> I know, but it, I mean, but it is weird. We do live in a weird bubble. I mean, it yeah, is true. Oh, and like, like I'm sure that person probably knew what Barbie and Oppenheimer were, but there's probably no way they probably knew what the creator was. I mean, it's just like mm-hmm. there's the, that bubble that we're in, kind of thing. It's, it's certain things just break step it. out of it. It's a matter also yourself. of of knowing your audience. And I think Kevin and I run into this a lot because yeah. I think on this show. We we talk to you at home listening as if you already know the things that we're right. talking about. When we make a mention of salt burn, we assume that most of you know what we're talking about, as opposed Emerald to burn. whenever we when Kevin and I go on our morning show. I kind of have to write and present from a different angle of like educating like, hey, there is this movie coming out. It's called mm-hmm. Saltburn. It is written, directed by a movie by or by a director and a filmmaker who made a movie a few years ago that you probably saw called Promising yeah. Young Woman. And that was a big, you know, you kind of have to. It's it's a reminder of like people have shit going on in their lives. And yeah. while we are, you know, while all of this takes up a huge portion of our focus for most people who have kids and lives and families and jobs like movies are a a part and sometimes a small part of their life and you just Mm -hmm. it's all it's all about knowing your audience i was in the in the street with all of the young families um who live on my block and michelle and Mm -hmm. i are like the old couple now at this point and uh so they came over and tried to make conversation you know uh to find a common ground and they were like seen Paw Patrol. <laughs> 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 I love that they tried though. Yeah, I was like, no, nah, I didn't have to see that one. And it's funny, yeah. it's the one that we haven't seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, no, but you should see poor things. Uh bring your kids. Oh yeah. gosh. Here is a movie that you probably don't have to uh, educate people on because they're likely very aware of the fact that it is coming to theaters. Is Taylor Swift's uh, Eras Tour, which is going to be opening in theaters on Friday the 13th. The, the day Sean, I can't believe you turned drops. her down for the show. I can't believe mm. she tried to come on. And, and yeah. I mean, like it was that was a kind of a harsh no. Yeah. Jake and I were Don't like you? we were the ones who were advocating for Taylor yeah. to come on the show. And Sean was just like, I don't know who that is. I'm in Here's a film Twitter bubble. There's there's media saturation when it comes to Taylor. You know, like how much more how much more attention does this girl honestly need? Um I have my tickets for opening night and I'm legitimately excited uh, to go see this because I kind of feel like it's going to be an audience experience that you don't get to replicate at the theaters that often. I'm really hoping that the crowd that I see it with on Friday night uh, is super into it. But I want to just start by going over some of the numbers ahead of time to let people know that, like, Yes, this year was pretty much dominated by a Barbie and Oppenheimer conversation, and those movies went on to do staggering amounts of money. Barbie went over a billion. Oppenheimer's getting very close. If it re-releases, I wouldn't be surprised if it got itself over a billion dollars. According to Variety, Taylor Swift's Eras Tour movie uh, is up to $125 million already from approximately 3,850 theaters in North America according to early estimates. So this is just pre-sale tickets. This film has already earned $125 million. I don't, is, I don't know that that's confirmed earned. I think those are estimates for what it will do over the weekend, which I think includes oh, gotcha. pre-sales, but I think this is okay. even day of. And, well, and, and, and to like Sean's that. point, like, like on the variety, I'm on Variety's website right now, so I'm just going to read it, quote them. They say, Swift's Eras Tour has already surpassed $100 million worldwide in advanced ticket sales. So, And, and okay, I know what they're doing... This. As like, well, too, which is one thing, because I went to look for my tickets and what I found is that they just keep adding more showtimes mm. like on the AMC app. Um, I clicked on a showtime that had no ticket, like no tickets available. And then I clicked on one that was like 15 minutes later and it was empty at the time being. And I was like, oh, they must have just added this. So I grabbed tickets to that one and then kind of like watched over the course of the week. I watched it fill up because I was like, I don't want to be one of the only two people sitting in the theater. I want the full blown experience kind of thing. But um, the theater just keep adding more tickets to meet or or more auditoriums to meet demand. But did you guys see that they're only doing screenings Friday, Saturday and Sunday? And then they're not during the week. And then again, oh. Friday to, to make it more of an event, which is making me wonder, like, how much one it's could extend the the run of this movie all the way through the holiday season. Yeah. Uh, but like, how much money are they missing out on Monday through Thursday? Well, that's interesting. I want to bring up that other point, because one of the other things, too, is in addition to it playing in the States, 
um, the Taylor Swift movie is expected to add 30 million to 50 million from 4,150 venues internationally in more than 90 countries. So its global start just from its opening weekend could be upwards of 150 to 175 million dollars. Now, Jake, you bring up that weekend strategy. One thing that that does is opens up screens for these other for, yeah, for that's movies true that too. aren't Taylor Swift. Yeah, I, I was, I was that wrong about that. It's really Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So so okay, sorry, so th- Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then no screenings Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then back Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They are leaving a lot of money on the table. That's true. Yeah. Also, it, I, I do want to mention real quick. Sorry, Jake. Um, one thing I do want to mention real fast. You know, this is talking about the movie itself i'm very excited to see this just in general because did you see her tour at all did you go no i wanted to go and i couldn't get tickets and that's why i think this is such a brilliant idea because that show those shows sold out so fast we all know about the the ticket master issues and all those things and one of the things i find interesting about this particular instance and this kind of happened when i when i when we were talking about the hamilton movie coming to disney plus when you go to a concert, oh, that's an interesting comparison. Yeah, when you go to a concert or you go to a um, when you go to a concert or you go to like a Broadway show, when you're in the audience, you're the editor. Right? I said this before on the show, but you're the editor, right? So if you're looking at Lin Manuel Miranda on the stage, and over here is Leslie Odom Jr. and you want to look at Leslie while he's speaking, and then swift your eyes to to Lin Manuel, you can do that because you're the editor in that moment as the audience member. When a movie comes out like this for Hamilton, for example. The shots are chosen for you. They go close up on the on the person when they want to. They are now editing the experience for you. Sure. So mm-hmm. when you go to a concert like Taylor Swift, same thing. You are wherever you are in the crowd. You can look around whatever you want to do. You're the editor. This is a very good. It's going to be finely tuned. I would imagine we're going to be close up on her at the piano or we're going to be close up well, on her singing. It's almost like a, that. that's cool. I, and I find that interesting. I think that's a really even if you have gone to the show, this is going to be a very different experience. You're going to be getting a lot more of an intimate experience. But also, I'm obsessed with her music. I think she's a brilliant poet, brilliant writer. I love her latest album. I'm very excited about this show and, and I'm and I'm just excited to see her see what this looks like. It's gonna be awesome. I would argue that most people that got to go to the shows sat pretty far away. Yeah, like, they're probably still going to the movie so they can get that oh, intimate yeah. experience. Well, yeah. you're going to get a better like I know you're talking it's about like, like a front row seat, basically. I think anyone yeah. that went through the trouble, I think even the millions of people that went, I think anyone who went through the trouble to get those hard to get tickets are also wanting to go see this. I think. They're yeah, sure. Because it's a different view. I, I found when you go to a stadium concert like that, you end up watching the, the screen, screen, the screen <laughs> yeah. anyway, right? Yeah. To get a better view of kind of what's happening. I don't know. I'm really torn because like, and I kind of went through this when Blink came through of like, nowadays you can get HD versions of the, of the shows. It's not the same you thing. You know, on YouTube the next day. It's not the same thing. So you say that, but then does that mean that this concert film is not going to be the same thing? This is different. You're in a movie theater with a larger screen. Like at home, you have you have a very min- you have your screen size. But like sure. you and I both I'd still went say to, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. You and I you and I you're both not, went to you're not sing them. You're not right. Sing them. Yeah. Like it, it's difference between yeah. like there they are right there. Versus so, Jakey, like, what do you think that this concert film is going to do? You think it's going to be satisfactory or yeah. you know, like, I mean, I, I think it's I think people are the I concert think, experience. I think people are satisfied before they've even seen it. The fact that it's happening, the fact that it's making people happy. Um, but the, the big question I have is and this is a shift is, is what this says about the studio system, because uh, Taylor Swift famously has gone around the studio system and has worked out a deal directly with AMC, which mm-hmm. is making a lot of people think, well, hell, like. That's interesting that that's a thing that can happen. But is there anyone else who's big enough who can do that? Because like Taylor Swift doesn't need no. Warner Brothers or Universal to promote her I don't movie. Think so so I think is there is, is is there anyone else who can like? Well, it, Beyonce's it felt doing like, it. Well, Beyonce, yeah, Beyonce's doing it. But the, I mean, even and I Billie hate Eilish. to like I hate to compare, <laughs> but like you know we're we're talking about a hundred plus million dollar opening for Taylor Swift and the number, the early numbers I've seen for Beyonce are 20 to 30 million. Yeah, but yeah. Taylor's a bigger artist. I mean, it's listen, so, Beyonce is an amazing artist, but Taylor yeah. is arguably the most famous. And again, this is a personal perspective. I would argue that Taylor is a, is the more famous well, of the not, two. That's not personal. That's, that's fact. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, just, that's like but a they're numerical both very fact. famous. Yeah, sure. I want to point, I have a question for you guys, but I also want to point something out about that. That's interesting. But I think we also have to look at this at, well, one with the studio system, it's a very different thing. And I think that that's kind of how 
you could get away with it. It's like, this isn't a narrative film. This isn't a necessarily a documentary film. But she, um, I think what pissed a lot of people off, and look, I, I'm not defending billion dollar studios because they should be paying their artists. But yeah, they there's an article that I read that apparently she ticked a lot of people off because she took meetings with everybody. Sure. The, over the summer and then apparently disappeared. And then a lot of studios found out this was happening the same way we did by just going, oh, we have a partnership. And so there was one quote that that was interesting. But that, you know was, what that sounds like to me? Yeah. That sounds like someone engaging in the entertainment business. The quote that I read that I loved was she spent all summer getting free advice and then yeah. went and made a better deal, which I thought sure. like, <laughs> I mean, was like, good for her. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, like, again, I'm not defending like these billion dollar studios that should be paying their actors and their writers. And many, the, you know, like, I was going to say, how many studios buy up a script just because it looks like one they're already developing yeah, and they throw it away? Exactly. You know, like, like it's just the entertainment. Yeah. But what and I also the majority of the money is going to the theaters too, which I love. One, I want to, there's two things. One with Beyonce doing the same thing in December, right, is when it comes out, which mm -hmm. is, which I find really interesting because we're going to get two big test cases in the same year within a couple months. I think that this is interesting. One, because this is added value. Like the production cost of this is the billion dollar tour that she mm -hmm. went on. Right. And they've already made the money off that tour. And and so mm -hmm. if you add, let's say. Two I'm making, billion dollars worldwide that tour yeah, made. But I'm making up a number. <laughs> what? <laughs> that, that's the what? second time that happened to me. <laughs> the last time was a thumbs up. Is someone, are are you all messing with me? Is no, that, I, I haven't touched I'm anything, like, I swear. That was great. Please leave that in. <laughs> uh, there was another one earlier, I don't know if you guys saw it, but yeah. What's interesting is that this is added value. And so let's say I make up a number and let's say the cost of this producing this, shooting it and, and editing it together, let's call it 10 to $20 million. I have no yeah. idea what it is. I don't know if that number's out there. Sure. If Beyonce, let's say it's the same thing and you're saying, oh, she's only going to open to 40 and it goes on to make a hundred. Yeah. If you can say, oh, yeah. hey, we can tack on a hundred million dollars to a tour. Yeah. I see this. I see this snowballing into becoming a regular thing. And yes, Taylor Swift is Taylor Swift. And yes, Beyonce is Beyonce. But imagine, you know, uh, the Rolling Stones, which is this mega uh, 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 band that has a lot of fans that maybe are not as fervent or as you know, aren't going to make as much money on a tour as Taylor Swift, but imagine right. they announce we're doing our final tour and we're going to record it. And then after the final tour and we've made $700 million, okay. all of our, all of our fans, especially a band that probably has aging fans that don't want to go stand at a venue. We can now put this in through the uh, theatrical system. Weirdly, I don't think that would do huge well, numbers. No, well, no, I'm, that, that's Strangely. my point. No, no, no. This is my point. It doesn't need to. It needs oh, I see. To, if it makes fifty million dollars and it costs yeah. them ten on top yeah. of this already thing, because you're already, already doing the show. Yeah, it's a yeah. sunk cost. It's a sunk but cost. But here's the thing: I think that this tour, and you're right about that, Gabe, 100. percent But I think that this tour, like the fact that this movie is arriving at the tail end of this already historic tour, yeah, is just like a perfect symmetry of Beyonce. Yeah is putting out a concert film, but I don't, and maybe, I, maybe I'm just missing the mark on this, but I don't think that there is this, uh, like the Taylor Swift doing the eras tour has this theme of, it's almost like a greatest hits, you know, concert. And then here she's turning around and delivering a movie version of that greatest hits concert. The one thing I can think of is maybe like you two is currently performing in that sphere, right? Oh, if they were figured out a so way cool. to bring this already unique event, you know, uh, to to the theaters, but any other band that's that's or artist that's putting out an album, unless it's like a, a, a historic, you know, album or tour, it, they, they often just because of the way that production takes time. It's very rare that I've ever seen anything line up this way. I, I will know? say the, the the just to give the Beyonce aspect a little bit credit. I mean, that that. That tour was massive. The Renaissance tour was huge. And apparently her movie, from what I understand from this Variety article, um, may contain it's like like there was a big question recently about whether or not both these films could be eligible for the Oscars. And and I think we talked a lot about the Taylor Swift one just because it's a, it's presenting as a concert. But I think the Beyonce one sounds like it's going to have more more in for more things in it. So according to the Variety article, I'm going to read this as a direct quote, quote, it will feature footage of 32 time Grammy winner rehearsing with her daughter and backup dancer Blue Ivy Carter. So it sounds like they've actually the Beyonce one's going to be more almost a movie Interesting. Uh, combined with the concert. The with, with Taylor and we haven't seen it yet. 
And I think the runtime is like two hours 45, which is interesting because I think the show runs three hours Shorter 15, three hours 15. Yeah. And something's so, getting cut. Right. And that's what well, you got to imagine. Three hour show. Is that 15 minutes of catch your breath talk? Apparently yeah. she doesn't do uh, a, a intermission or it's like a quick changes. Um, but the Beyonce one sounds like it might actually be more docu style. And 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 her tour was very historic. She played they two both nights were massive, here. Yeah. yeah and, and for for Beyonce, particularly, she came to two nights here at FedEx. She did this thing called the mute challenge, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Where, and and she like, does that in every city. It's really kind of cool. Um, but back to what Taylor. Wait, wait. What basically, is basically I think everyone stays silent for yeah, a certain There's, a, there's of time. one of her lyrics says, like, put it on mute. And okay. what she's challenging her crowds is to, after she says that, can everyone just shut the hell up? Like, just to kind of give it in the effect. And like it inevitably, just drops like, you, like she, yeah, she That's wants cool. you, yeah. But like, obviously, some cities do it better than others. So it's but kind of become, I believe, an unofficial competition between the cities yeah. of who can do the best mute challenge. That's pretty cool. Yeah. But and Kevin, to your point, did you read the article that like about whether or not because th- th- this article is saying that they're not eligible for the Oscars? Well, I think what the only thing that I think the Variety article is saying about the Beyonce one is that if she is showing so. If she is showing that additional footage, that could pertain possibly to an argument of being a nomination. I don't I'm not saying that it's going to happen for sure, sure. But but Taylor's sounds like it's just a concert specifically. And I and, and I got to say, the one thing I'm interested in, which I'm really excited about, because I watched a lot of the TikTok videos of Taylor's show. Um, she does this stage dive. Uh, have you guys seen this video uh, where yeah. she dives yeah, into yeah, yeah. the stage? I want to know what that looks like. And I'm hoping that there's a camera maybe attached to her. And we follow her into that dive. Are we gonna get a 3D re-release in 2024? It'd be that would be awesome. Um, but James in all Cameron honesty, directs it. 4 I, I, I think I think both of these are great for the industry. Um, yeah. they're great. Oh, sure. they're, they're they're great Absolutely. for 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 a theatrical push. Um, I do think Beyonce's numbers will be bigger than that. Those obviously that's not coming till December. Mm-hmm. Um, but I but I do think those numbers will will be uh, will be higher, and I think she'll probably go out and do promo for it, hopefully, and things like that. But that sounds it. I think they're both going to be very different movies. Can you imagine some poor geologist who spends like two years inside a volcano <laughs> doing a documentary, thinking like this is my shot, right. <laughs> I'm going to win an Oscar, and then Taylor Swift and Beyonce drop concert documentaries that get qualified for Oscar. <laughs> um, yes. I want to b- before we move on. I want to ask you. I kind of got on this, but I want to ask you guys plainly to I think to sort of put a button on this. We've talked about on this show. We've we've had interviews with the National Association of Theater Owners talking about how they're really trying to find different ways to bring people to the theater that aren't. We need a giant blockbuster, and that meaning something like this. I think is a perfect example. Uh, TV events, um, live sports events, things like that. With that sort of the theatrical business being in that mindset, and then this seeming like it's going to be a home run and possibly two home, home runs back to back. As It'll be soon, two home runs. As, as soon as 2024, do you guys think that this is going to be something that we see grow within the theatrical oh, business? Is going to be an actual God, yeah, yeah. business model uh, yeah, that, abs- that changes Hollywood, things? Hollywood cannot let a successful thing just be a successful thing. Right. They're already... The pro- really, I, no, go ahead, Kevin. No, so the, pro- the big problem, though, is... Besides Beyonce and Taylor Swift, who you oh, asked yeah, us I'm not earlier, saying anything will be as big, but like sure. right now, I guarantee you there are meetings where every studio in Hollywood is going, what let other me, bands can let do? Me, do let this? me rephrase. Let me rephrase because because like, you're getting into the business of it, which is fair, but that's not exactly what I mean. I mean culturally. Like, do you think that this has the chance with it hitting a splash like this and with the business itself being interested in no. it being no. a thing where people go, I want to see a concert film in a theater with a crowd? I, I think, think these think are so. two very specific cases. <laughs> uh, I don't know what's going on here. Um, I think these are two very specific cases, in my opinion. Um, these are very, very massive. Like Blink-182, for example, they went on a huge reunion tour this year. Sean and I both went. Would you not go these, see that tour, a, a I, documentary on that tour? I would, a documentary I, I would, live show? I would, but I don't think it's the same thing. Um, like Blink is a big band in, uh-huh. in Sean and I's world. Beyonce and Taylor Swift have they are so they're they're they have transcended yeah well, i i guess i just i guess i just disagree with that premise i love I, blank I, don't I, get me wrong yeah, yeah <laughs> but I, I i think we're arguing two different things i agree that this is as big as maybe it could ever be but i more think that this will allow for smaller things to come to the sure. forefront and it be normalized for but, hey they have a big blink has a big following they're going to be incentivized to to monetize i don't think theaters. people would go i don't well, think I, I, didn't, I, I don't think they would have enough like the, 
the concert film is not a new concept. <laughs> It's right, been but this around is, for decades upon decades. I right. mean, that's if, why this if it is was historic. a proven business model, I think more yeah. artists would have been doing it. And, we, like, and that's like, why Gabe, you, sort you of mentioned said, Rolling Stone. Scorsese already did a Rolling Stone yeah. movie. Sure, sure. But again, I, I think I more mean because this is such a big wave, that has the sure. chance to catch the culture and create something that people want to enjoy. Versus, it's I a short sure it these artists, If these artists knew that there was an, a revenue stream for them to tap into. Like, I think the revenue stream was really just the DVD market of them putting mm-hmm. out DVDs of their shows, yeah. which was the thing for the longest time. Yeah. Um, I think Taylor Swift's an anomaly. I think her being absolutely. able to bring Without, this, there's, this yeah, complete absolutely. package to the theaters and say, I'm offering this to you guys run with it. You know, um, I'm, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm curious. I think, I think that there's a really big potential for this to have lasting effects yeah, uh, at least with what theaters are interested in doing. Will they be successful? Who knows? But I, I think within the next couple of years, especially theaters like AMC that are really buying into this are going to be looking for new ways to to replicate this. Maybe at a smaller I'm, scale, certainly at a smaller scale. But I'm pretty sure I went and saw a U2 concert film at an IMAX theater years hum. ago. Rattle, yeah. Well, Rattle yeah. and Hum went to theaters and I, after and, the Joshua Tree. That was a combination concert video and movie and, and that was but they were at the height of their uh their popularity again, again too coming off of joshua tree they were it wasn't that orbit. one for me it was another no, one no. i know um uh, there were some instances of game of thrones being shown on the big screen here mm-hmm. and there and here and there but it felt a little unofficial do you think if something like game of thrones were still on the air and it were this this show that had has often been compared to like a theatrical experience if game of thrones are still on the air after Taylor Swift, that it would be more of a like, hey, we're going to start showing Game of Thrones on there'd, Sundays at nine o'clock. There'd be less thing. people complaining about not seeing that episode on their TV because it'd be yeah. per- <laughs> perfectly projected. It would have to be like you think about the the Sopranos finale. Yeah. Or even like the Lost, lost you know, finale. finale. Yeah. It would I would have, have to be something the that has the the culture like gabe was mm-hmm. saying a cultural event it has to have yeah. the the attention of game of thrones would have been a perfect nation. example game of thrones yeah. Yeah. and and i, I, thought I don't you think there's anything the finale right in a theater didn't you guys no, we went to um theater? kevin and i kevin and i were in london and when it aired which meant that it aired at like what kevin like like midnight or one o'clock in the morning and we went to a pub that was oh. projecting it on a wall and it actually was kind of my favorite thing and it was kind of amazing yeah. Like we all like we were all there, Kevin. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like for Rocket Man, yeah. We're no, because Sean, yeah. no, because Sean was there. Phoenix. I was there yeah, too, but yeah. I couldn't watch it with you guys because I had to do yeah, my reaction right. video. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and and we found a, like a pub like on the on the uh, like out in the uh, not not full blown burbs of London, but I had to go outside London a little bit, and it was kind of great. Like and and the the best part was I was so worried about like people talking and stuff, but the second that HBO logo came on, someone just said in a in a beautiful British accent, "Shut the fuck up," and you could have heard a pin <laughs> drop for the next ninety minutes. It was kind of great. Yeah, I'm excited. Listen, I know we're going to move on, but I'm excited to see this. I think it's a I do think this that the Beyonce and the Taylor Swift. I think the, I think this is an anomaly. I think both of them. Um, I and again, to Gabe's point, it, it, you know, Hollywood's going to try and learn a lesson from this and whether it's a good lesson or a bad lesson, whatever that's going to be. Yeah, I just don't see another other other artists have this much pull. I, just I, don't, don't, I don't know, man. I predict that you're going to see Drake come out with a with a but Drake. But Drake wouldn't sell like this. I, I, I di- Again, Kevin, it's a different argument. It's not about will it sell like this. It's will they see value in doing it and normalizing it until it becomes a thing. Like that. That's yeah. my question. Not who's going to make $2 billion on a tour. I agree that that is imp- impossible to replicate. But I think if these do this well, there's way too much money in it for people to, to not try to it's, do it. Especially, too, because when you think about like how much of a ticket price Disney takes from movie studios like movie studios don't need it to do that well if they're making yeah. <coughs> excuse me if they're getting 50 or 60 percent of the movie ticket they don't mm. give a shit if it only makes 20 million dollars because yeah. uh, 20 million dollars with the percentage they're getting from a concert might be more valuable than the percentage they get from a hundred million dollar Marvel movie yeah mm. you know what's interesting you might see artists plan like roll this into their creative plan. Oh, I'll use this, yeah. I'll use this as an example. Like, and I know the police just did this, but let's say the three original members of the police got back together. Right. And they said, we're going to do five cities. But after those five cities, we're also going to have a concert film rollout kind of thing. 
Mm-hmm. So don't worry that you didn't get a chance to go to, you know, New York, London, L.A. kind of thing. But as part of our push for this big reunion that we're doing, it's going to have a concert film attached to it. If artists start to plan yeah. that way, then it could become and, something. And something maybe they enticing. make an event by only doing like the maybe in, in like a Taylor Swift. They say, hey, you know, it's just going to air this weekend, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, one weekend sure. only. So it's an event. But also like you don't have to. It's not like it's not like a fathom event where you have to be there at that time on that day. It's like you got sure. all weekend, but it's this weekend and only this weekend. You know who might be good for this? Bruce Springsteen. I was literally just thinking, thinking the boss. I was seriously just thinking, boss. Yeah, if he I, did think, he, I think he, tour. yeah, if he did like a big rollout and said, like you just said, and then like had a theatrical yeah. IMAX Dolby experience. Yeah, I could see people going. I could see that being yeah. or sure. Elton. Yeah. Elton would be good. I, yeah, I, did, I, I, I think there's tour. countless people you could you could call and on that have Gabe's, devoted Gabe's, followings. Gabe's point's really good. I mean, and Gabe basically said if this is an additional 10, 15 million dollars added on to the production of already the scale of the concert you're doing and then the movie makes 50, the other that 35 or 40 million right there is is extra money. So so he's right. It doesn't have to make two or three hundred million like Taylor Swift might. Well, but, but more importantly, what yeah. we're overlooking is you're bringing this show to millions of people who couldn't see it. Yeah. Yeah. Who didn't get a chance to yeah. see it? Like that, that was a, an impossible ticket to get. That's the huge so. thing about that. I'm really yeah. fascinated. Again, we keep saying we need to move on. I'm really fascinated to see how many people rewatch this and how long it lasts and how far it goes. Because I, oh, I, 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 I hope it goes. I hope it goes for months. Follow me for a second. I was going to ask, but is that crazy? Is I don't think. I don't think a billion think, seems I, crazy. A billion seems crazy if only just because it's disappeared. Like like four out of when did you no three out of seven days a week it's not playing. Yeah, but but on the lesser, lesser days, the lesser but, days though. But I think that this is a again. This is only Taylor Swift and potentially only Beyonce. This is the sort of thing like, yeah, it's only available every weekend, but how many of her fans are going to go? It's in theaters for four weekends sure. or however many. I'm going to see it every weekend, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It could Guys, be- what if we did real blend the concert tour? Movie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, before we, we move on, ten dollars. Before we move on real quick. Yes or no. Hit a billion. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say no. I, I would love I say to. No. I would love to. I have no idea. Have they said how long it's staying in theaters? I no, they haven't yet. I think it. I think it has to be in but theaters for six weeks. But because it's AMC, they'll just leave it, right? They'll oh just yeah, leave she it. can stay as long as she wants in theaters. I, I think they're going to leave it in there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's no streaming until date, Beyonce. So it, like, it might yeah. be there yeah. until yeah. Beyonce. They haven't even worked a streaming deal yet. They don't even have a, stream, <laughs> a streaming distributor I'm, yet. Kevin, I'm saying yes. I just wanted to. Do you know I'm I mean, such an idiot that um, when she announced the 1989 album, um, it said. I was in New York um, visiting family members and I was with one of my nieces who was super into Taylor Swift. And she was like, I can't stay up till 2 a.m., but I think she's going to announce it during this Los Angeles performance. So I saw the headline and it said 1989 TV. And I thought, oh, my God, Taylor Swift launched her own TV network. Like, that's insane. <laughs> but it's Taylor's version. I had no clue. I mean, I know she's doing all that. She's recreating her abbreviation. I didn't but know that. But I wasn't surprised that I, she created her own network. Yeah. I was like, yeah, hey, good for her. Why not? And- <laughs> She is pretty significant. All right, let's rock it through this really fast because the day that we were recording um, our episode, there was news that dropped about uh, Marvel sort of rejiggering its TV strategy, uh, then going back to square one on the Daredevil Born Again series. And I just want to take a moment to comment on this because I feel pretty strongly about um, the fact that I think that this is a really great idea. Um, I'm enjoying Loki so far. I think it's a real step up in terms of quality and storytelling. Um, and I'm a Marvel apologist. You guys know that I'm in for anything that What's they your, what uh, your shirt do. Take? It's, can't see it's a dark shirt. Is yeah. it? it says it says Marvel. Oh, okay. and I Miss Minutes. Is that Black on, Panther? Obviously. I'm in the bag. Yes, that's Black Panther from the comic. Um, awesome. And I, but but I am I fully admit that that Marvel has been gravitating towards the McDonald's of of content lately uh, and putting things out because they feel that they that they need to uh, versus um, wait, no, trying to meet a need uh, versus telling stories that that demand to be told. And so if they are taking the time to view the first few episodes of a of a very important show for them, uh, like a, a Daredevil reboot and say, no, this isn't working um, and let's start over. Uh, I think that that's key. And so as part of this um, 
revelation uh, and this report that was in Hollywood Reporter that they're changing their strategy to uh, television, their approach to television by actually hiring showrunners uh, to take over their their programs and treat Marvel and Disney Plus series the way that you would an existing television show and not the movies, which I didn't realize how much of the movie structure they were trying to just pick up and jam into the place of a TV series. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, that I don't get revealing. that. that. That's like, that's like hearing from a marathon runner on mile 14. All right, guys, I think we've made a mistake. We're going to start wearing shoes. Right. <laughs> and it, like, it just makes you go, why? I'm sorry, you weren't doing that from the beginning? Like, right. like this, 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 is this like all feels Wars. very television. Like this, exactly. The that's the trilogy. first thing I thought of. A hundred percent. Like, you didn't have it planned out when you started making well, it? Like, like, this all feels very, like, common sense to me. And what's staggering is if you take a minute and just think about the different Marvel projects that have either changed direction, you know, creatively behind the scenes mm -hmm. by getting rid of a director you know, Fantastic Four had John Watts before it had Matt Shankman. Uh, Blade has been through God knows how many iterations uh, since it was announced. Um, and then, you know, the different TV series that stop and start and have been announced and then don't come around. It, it goes all the way back to when they announced an Inhumans movie that was supposed to come into theaters. And, and you know, then it became a TV show that lasted one season. So I don't know what's going on over there. And it's been interesting that Kevin Feige has been absent. It used to be that he would come around on all of these press tours and he would triumphantly talk about Marvel Studios. But it feels like there's a major, major reset. And personally, I just think that it's a good idea. I think that it's it's smart for them to press pause and to start putting out content that matches the quality bar that had been raised by them in the first two, um, first two or three phases. Kevin and I were having this conversation when Loki started up and it was about a lack of interest in in Marvel storytelling, they have to go a long way um, to push a boulder uphill to convince people to come back around to the shows. And one of the things I thought that was really inspiring that the um, executive one of the executive producers or creative heads at Marvel said of um, we need to create shows that people want to come and watch because they love the characters and they love the show and not just because it sets up the next Avengers. <laughs> Oh my I don't understand what's going on here. I, 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 can someone please explain this to me? So goddamn funny. <laughs> please leave this in, Gabe. I, I really hope that it, like Kevin gets to do like a Zoom interview with like Martin Scorsese, and Scorsese's talking go. about like death and all this sort of stuff, and all of a sudden it just goes. Well, now I'm yes. worried because I was on a Zoom interview earlier today, and I'm wondering if that popped up. Let me jump oh in. God. Maybe I'll leave this in, but I have to give context because we are not. I'm not recording the Zoom. Kevin's Zoom is is popping up emojis on his face. <laughs> Balloons. But uh, yeah. it, that's the fun that we're having. It's highly unusual. Happy, anyway, happy that, birthday, that's Kev. my take on on Marvel shakeup. Did you guys have any <laughs> pros or cons as to in terms it, of what they're just, doing? It's just one of those like it's a little for like I feel like they're getting a lot of kind of fairly positive press and reaction out of this. But like for me, it's frustration because it's just like, yeah, you should be. Yeah, this is good to do but you why weren't i don't understand why you weren't doing this all along like i don't like i'm like i'm not going to praise you for just figuring out that you should have been doing something from day one like that's the, well, i don't but understand it's, it's lesson learned i mean isn't yeah. it good that they're say, trying to course correct they, this is like a, again to turn us into a sports podcast um <laughs> a lot of the times people talk about this in sports where they're like oh shouldn't shouldn't they have done x y or z like why are they trying to change the playbook but it's very easy for pundits or for us to go like, oh, isn't it obvious? You should have done the thing that was successful before. But if it were different and they changed it and then they won a World Series, we'd go, that's genius. Right. The, the same thing right. could happen, but the coin was flipped the other way. And we go, look at that. They reinvented TV. Right. Obviously, that also, didn't work. But I just want to say one thing about Marvel as well, too, with this is that for a long time, no matter what they put out, they were met with praise, mm -hmm. you know? Oh and yeah, they were like untouched for well, years. The, you couldn't say it. You couldn't say anything bad about Marvel well, for like the, the first ten thing, years. The origin thing plagued them for a long time. During all the or, of that. origin thing, origin story, like this feels like phase one. I felt like was oh, oh, a oh. common criticism through yeah third. But phase like I mean, all. it took it took like Eternals and then you know a couple of the movies after that yeah. that didn't really hit. Where Multiverse people were like, of Madness is where oh, it really wait, is Marvel shifted. not good anymore. <laughs> Is Marvel not that good anymore? Yeah, because, yeah, Kevin, that's that's one of the ones where and, and again, COVID was an issue and, you know, production obstacles and everyone got hit by that. So I, I will always stand by 
after Endgame, they should have disappeared for ten years mm. and should have made us. Years? Yes, ten and they years. should have made us Maybe miss a year. them. Jake, I'd like to. Nah. I'd like to pull up how much money they've made. Since no, Endgame. I mean, trust me, I, I, I understand <laughs> the finances behind it, but like, yeah. like they should have made us because it, it took away from the power of like this big powerful ending. If like you know, three months later, it's like, oh, here's another one. It's just like, well, uh, okay, all right, like. I sure, did love Far like, From Home, though. I did love Far From Home. Yeah, but imagine that movie, like, imagine, like, a movie about Spider-Man sort of dealing with the loss of Iron Man five years later. Sure. Like, like, and, and that's like, the first like they, time we're catching up with them. They literally use the timeline of the snap and wait yeah. five years and then come back. <laughs> that would be that a would terrible, be. terrible business model. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, trust me. I understand, you know, very, very rarely do good creative ideas and good business ideas go right. hand in yeah. hand. And, I disagree. And this is why I, I don't run a studio. I, I disagree, though, because I think I wanted more Marvel immediately. I think they just should have made better. Marvel. Yeah, but just because you want something better. doesn't mean you should have. Like, I, I wanted more Star Wars and look where we're at. Yeah, 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 but those were bad Star Wars. Like, that's my point. It's a, good point. Like, it's a simple okay, thing to say. Bad Marvel. I agree. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying if they had made good Marvel right away, yeah. I, we wouldn't have this conversation. Yeah. yeah. To I mean, it's, point, it, though, it, it does hurt the brand a little bit. Absolutely. Sure. Like, like it, 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 as as much money as they had made, I don't. I wouldn't agree with ten years, but maybe had they waited a year, I think that would have been helpful. I mean, I do agree that it, it's gotten to a point now where I find it not annoying, but. I'm just like, oh, there's another one. Isn't uh, so, you know? There's Star Wars, and it, it, it just, I just don't. Feel, it's not special to me anymore. Um, and I do believe that they, you know, this is how Hollywood works. Something does well, get greedy, you make a bunch more, and they're gonna, you know, that's what's gonna happen with Barbie. They're gonna make every Mattel movie, and, and it's not, it's not gonna, it's not gonna have the same success as Barbie. Though, to meet, to meet, to meet Jake in the middle, because I don't think he's wrong in that 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 would be successful. I think the fact that they ramped up to Sean, what was it, three movies a year, was kind of the yeah. steady yeah. that we've been. If mm-hmm. they had said, hey, post, we're gonna, we're gonna come down to two movies a year. Um, while especially while this year, like what? or one or Three one a year and TV shows. Yeah, yeah like, a year I, is I think perfect. the fact that it was as much as they were doing, definitely. I think slowing down a little bit probably would have had the effect that you're talking about, Jake. But we're never in a world where they were going to stop. Here's the thing, also yeah, yeah. though, you're never going to make everybody happy. Yeah, people would have found reasons to complain about. Yeah, but no I'm what. less worried about other people's happiness. <laughs> I'm <laughs> far true. more concerned about my own. Fair I enough. say that about you all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> here's something that is likely going to make anybody who listens to this show very, very happy. Uh, the fall of the House of Usher drops oh, I this week. I thought, I thought you knew something about the actor strike. I thought you were announcing the actor strike. Oh no, oh, God, no! I told you once we wrap the yeah. show, that's when it'll finally come back. They're, um, they're literally they've got it figured out. They're waiting on us to finish. I'm actually yeah. I actually have an email typed up to SAG after alone know as soon as yeah. we're done. Yeah. You we're dialed can... into the meeting. They're listening. They're listening to our show right now. Bob <laughs> yeah. Iger's like listening to us right now, waiting. Uh, Mike Flanagan. Let's get back to Mike Flanagan. There we go. <laughs> Mike Flanagan uh, has a new limited series. Do we know how many episodes Fall of the House of Usher? Uh, let me look. Is I don't know. I'll look right 10, now. 10, 8, 10. No matter what, it's going to be amazing. Yes. Um, Flanagan had uh, Midnight Mass, um, Haunting, Haunting of, of Hill House, House, Haunting of Bly Manor. Haunting of Bly Manor. Obviously, did Dr. Sleep and the incredible uh, director's cut of Dr. Sleep. Yeah. And now has the. Um, Eight. Eight, eight, episodes. Beautiful. eight episodes beautiful also beautiful. one of our best and guests ever he's on amazing yeah. Yeah. tremendous go Just back tremendous we did like two and a half hours or something with him for for um dr sleep and then we had him back for midnight mass i'll, yeah. I'll drop those in the people. in the description yeah. sorry didn't mean to cut you off i mean the, he's the, gearing the, up. the the tremblay story is oh, yeah. <laughs> is dude a, without question one of the greatest stories told on a real planet episode. I, Told Tremblay that's I mean, I was interviewing it's so funny. Uh, I was interviewing Jacob Tremblay for um, for people who don't know what we're talking about. Basically, we, when we had Flanagan on the show, there's a, a really horrific scene in Dr. Sleep that involves Jacob Tremblay's character being um, very brutally attacked. Um, and they had a fake doll that was made of him called Fake Up Tremblay. And not only that, they filmed it on Jacob Tremblay's birthday. So apparently after I guess after they shot it, they like celebrated whatever. So I'm interviewing Jacob Tremblay and David Diggs for Little Mermaid and I pop up on a Zoom for Disney <laughs> and like the first like minute of the interview, I'm just talking about 
Flanagan on our podcast and fake up trembling. He's like dying laughing. And it was just like, I'm sure Disney's probably like, what is going on right yeah. now? Why, Kevin, why Kevin starts his interview with, all right, so when you were getting murdered. <laughs> in Dr. Sleep. Yeah. But his reaction to fake up trembling was just the full circle it's that, to that interview. Oh. It's the best. Um, all right. So make sure you guys check that out because we want to get Mike on um, if the actor strike is able to come to an end. He's, in I the think meantime, he's starting... Um, production on a new Stephen King movie. I know because he because, well, you know, he he and this isn't meant to be a uh, humble brag. He follows all of us on Instagram. And so from time to time, every once in a while, I'll just sort of touch base with him and in the DMs, as the kids say. Uh, but yeah, he's 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 uh, ramping up production, gearing up to get ready, which is a sign that hopefully I think everyone thinks that the actor strikes coming to an end soon. But um, he is doing and look, Stephen King's short stories have a great history of making for incredible films. And this is a much more sort of dramatic. This is much more of like a stand by me kind of uh, Stephen King. Yeah. Shawshank kind of Stephen King movie. What story is it? Do you know? It's I forget the name. It's 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 in If It Bleeds. OK. Um, and Mark Hamill is going to be in it. And uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be something something special. And then he <laughs> begins an usher, his, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, Hamill's an usher. And He's then he begins the, his um, the Flanagan family, the Flanna family. Awesome. Yeah, the, 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 something there. The Flanna fam. So I was doing a rewatch of um, Hill House oh, and I, I just did a rewatch of Midnight Mass. I think the bent neck lady episode is the one of the greatest episodes of television ever created. Yeah, I like the, Hill House the whole the entirety of Hill House is one of the best pieces of horror incredible. I've ever seen in my life. So good. It's incredible. The, the story that that episode yeah. in particular breaks my heart. They told me a story about what I think is probably the greatest jump scare in history, which if you know Hill House, you know, the jump scare. It's it involves two people talking in a car. And someone scaring them oh, from the back seat. Yeah. Oh my god! And yeah, they yeah, told me, it was, and it was a very. Um, they told me the story behind it. It was a very sort of like if you know the story with Alan Rickman and Die Hard, where like there was a point in their oh, conversation yeah. where the actress was supposed to come from the back seat and and scream and scare them. And Mike Flanagan, I guess, took her aside and said, "Okay, you're supposed to enter at this point of the conversation. Enter about thirty seconds earlier at this point mm. in the conversation." So their fear, their jump is. Real. legitimate and that As is i think mine. yes that that's probably <laughs> the most i've ever like l- been affected by like to the point where i think i like, grabbed my heart it was such a good job and i normally jump scares can be cheap that was a well-earned jump scare i am the, uh, the rick the rickman story real quick that's the one where they dropped him from they dropped him on two and- and it was supposed to be three, right? So, yeah, yeah. So, so, like, three, so And so he's falling, and that's his yeah, real... His face, yeah, his face of yeah. shock is, yeah. That's great. I'm in the middle of a Midnight Mass rewatch. It is still Oh, amazing. I just watched it with my girlfriend. I'm going to get back to a Hill uh, hill House, but I did rewatch Bly Manor, which, Sean, I don't know if you're playing to, but on my second rewatch, I like. I, I think I love Bly Manor, but it hit me even harder on this this I second love, go. I didn't love Bly I, Manor. I sleep on Bly I, it, Manor a little bit. I think I we slept on, on Bly Manor. It is an incredibly touching story. It really it is. But, also, but is it like, it's like, uh, like Hill House is 100% him. Bly Manor, didn't he kind of have a foot yeah. in both camps? He was doing Bly Manor and Dr. Sleep he, at the same he time. He basically, well, I think he, regardless of the Dr. Sleep thing, I think after Hill House, he was very much like, I don't want to do a, th- do a thing where I, I direct every episode. I want to yeah. work with mm-hmm. other directors. I want to have a more sort of bigger picture view on it, I think was his perspective but it's great i mean it, it feels very cohesive it's there's yeah. not like a. Yeah. what if he it, does dark tower yeah. well then he's going oh. that's well because keep in mind this this uh house of usher is the last thing he's doing with netflix his deal his deal is done right and, and then uh, and then he dark does towers this at amazon dark towers at amazon oh, mm. god but see but I think it's, it's one of those yeah. things like with king when King started writing that series, you just wanted him to finish it. Yeah. Right. And it was after he got into his accident where he got hit by the van. Yeah. He kind of hustled to finish yeah. that story just so it wouldn't go. So now I would want yeah. Mike to like race through it and finish well, dude, it. One of the most so uh, daunting. Did you, Sean, did you ever read On Writing? It's no, it's I never of, did. It, it is, I think, one of Stephen King's best books, but he tells a yeah. story about um, a man on death row who sent him a letter basically saying, hey, uh, I need to know how Dark Tower ends. And I think by that point, he was only on like book four or something. That Um, sounds like a Stephen King short story. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. 
I'd still, what kind I'd of honestly, pressure Steve, is that on Stephen him, King short stories are some knew. of my favorite. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, Stephen. Yeah, because he, he never knows. Whenever he always talks about like the writing process, he never knows where it's going to go. But Stephen oh. King short stories are some of my favorites. He did one. One of my favorite Stephen King short stories is a guy who uh, is like a traveling salesman or something, and he always stops in old grimy bathrooms and is like obsessed with like the graffiti that people write in stalls, mm. and like becomes obsessed with like the stories behind. Oh, it's like his story. His, if, if if you've never read King before, and some of his books are so big. They can be daunting. Do yourself a favor and just pick up a collection of his short stories. A lot of them are granted. None of them are short. A lot of them are like 75 to 100 pages. But like, have you ever read the jaunt? the jaunt? Oh, is that like the, the jump in time? Like the time yeah. and like in like you have to keep your eyes closed. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, so good. I pr- I printed that uh, <laughs> because I wanted to read it. And something happened where so it printed on both sides and then something happened where the sh- the order got knocked out of, out of place. Oh, no. So I haven't been able to put it together yet to figure out how to read it. I should Do probably a Tarantino it. style. Read it's, it like when, it's like when TV episodes, it's like when TV episodes get mixed up. Sean's just got pages in the middle of nowhere. Someone in the middle is like, we have to go back. Um, Why am I not surprised that Sean printed that out considering he watches movies on sci fi and TNT? Hey, I'm just, I, I I'm just have, whenever I read, I've got to have a physical form. I'm oh, old no. school that way. Oh, no, oh. a physical book's different. I'm talking yeah. about like printing it out on printer paper. Yeah. And then, the printer. And then, <laughs> yep. I can sit in my rocking chair. <laughs> read it's, like, remember, it's like one of those old printers. Remember, like, where all the papers were like connected and you had to rip them? So it was like one line. It's like a scroll. I tear, I tear the perforated <laughs> edges <laughs> off of the side. <laughs> <laughs> or, like, the printer hey, went back <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love Sean old jokes. It's my favorite thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> all right anyway let's go uh down into the comments below and i want you guys in honor of the creator and uh our guest this week gareth uh edwards please tell us a movie that struggled at the box office um that you guys think should have done better tell us a movie that struggled at the box office that you honestly think should have done better that's your call to action in the comments down below and in the meantime follow us on social media uh, Jake is at Jake's Takes. Kevin is at Kevin McCarthy TV. I am at Sean underscore O'Connell. Gabe is at Gabe Kovach. And the show is at Real Blend. We'll talk to you guys next week when hopefully it has been determined that the studios have decided to pay to their pay actors. Their yeah. And Sean will be printing out the entire dialogue of this it's still episode. Printing. It's um, still so printing. if you want to read it on computer paper, <laughs> that's the newsletter this week. So stay tuned. <laughs> Dunkirk. <laughs> the man who moved the earth. <laughs>